All right, well, welcome everyone to the benefits of employee decarbonization. Uh, this course is brought to you by all of our sponsors who support our work and allow us to do what we do, especially uh, our sponsor, um, Indo Window. Um, storm windows on the inside, yes, these improve uh, performance with window inserts, feel warmer in the winter, cool in the summer while saving up to 20% on bills. Third-party studies show up to a 10% reduction in air leakage for whole home upgrades. The do-it-yourself Indo inserts are made of acrylic panel edge with a soft patented silicone compression tube that presses into interior, interior storms and frames. You can learn more about this at uh, indowindows.com and definitely, I think, an awesome opportunity to help uh, decarbonize your employees' home by helping them get access to better window performance. All right, well, welcome again, everyone, to the benefits of employee decarbonization. This course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. I, today, will be your moderator. I am the education director here, among our two other employees, Eliza and Jose, who help keep our organization running. This course is approved for multiple continuing education units, including AIALU and a certified green home professional designation within the um, energy pathway. So um, I'm going to hand it off to our uh, speakers here today. And again, just note that um, it's really important that, especially as we make the transition uh, and still continue to work from home, uh, and do and, and that happens more and more, even um, with many of the issues subsiding that we've had the reason for doing that. Uh, how do we help uh, support uh, from a corporate standpoint, people who are making that transition and reducing uh, the carbon impact um, and improving health? And so that's why I'm super excited to um, continue this conversation that we've had here for many years at GHI on and off and um, present to you Lauren and Vicki from Canopy, who are going to introduce themselves and Canopy and tell you a little bit more about opportunities. So Laura and Vicki, welcome. Please take it away. Thanks so much, Brett. Um, and it's great to meet everyone. Let me share my screen, make sure everything works good. Um, and then we can hop into this topic, which um, we are super passionate about and can talk um, more about that as we get started. So um, we're here to talk about how you can support your employees with climate efforts at home. Um, I think many of you know this, but more and more companies are making net zero commitments. And as they work to achieve those commitments, they should also be engaging employees as part of the solution, both at work and at home. Um, so we're going to discuss how companies can um, help their employees to reduce those household emissions um, around home and transportation, how they can measure and reduce um, their corporate scope three emissions that are also related to commute um, and work from home and improve health, safety, and resilience. Um, so quick intros. Um, I'm Lauren Fraser, one of the co-founders um, and head of partnerships at Canopy. And what we do at Canopy is really help companies um, work with their employees to reduce emissions. We provide a platform to make this really easy, both the measurement and the education and really guiding people through that transition side of things. Um, and we also work with cities and um, community-based organizations around the same types of things. How can we help residents reduce their emissions at home um, and you know, help support city goals as well? Um, and anyway, if you're interested in Canopy, we can follow up on that later, but I'm gonna hand it over to Vicki. Hello everyone, um, I'm Vicki Wolbowski, one of the co-founders and head of product at Canopy. Um, and I will let Lauren, uh, I won't talk about myself too much, I'll let Lauren take it away. Awesome. Um, so why should companies engage their employees um, on this topic? Um, one of the big ones is um, to help companies make real reductions in their corporate carbon offset emissions. Um, we'll talk more about that in the scope three discussion that we're going to have, but also there's a big benefit in engaging and supporting their employees, um, which impacts well-being, hiring, retention, and ultimately supports a healthier workforce, um, much like other common benefits, healthcare, financial, and family support um, that many companies offer their employees. 
Um, this is also a big opportunity for companies to inform and educate their employees around this big decarbonization challenge in front of us, which is what we're all working on, um, and to help take steps to both help employees make a plan and get access to rebates, incentives, financing, and help employees understand what's available to them to start to make these upgrades. Um, so one of the big, you know, benefits for companies is really around their emissions reporting um, and both employee commute and work from home factor into that. Um, so you'll see, I don't know how familiar everyone is with, with, um, uh, with greenhouse gas reporting, but um, employee commute and the, as they call it, telework fall into scope three, category seven. Um, so employee commute makes a lot of sense um, how employees get back and forth to work every day, but for some companies can be a pretty big source of their scope three emissions. Um, and so helping, you know, sort of any sort of reductions we can help make there are, are pretty impactful. Um, the data is often calculated to make that calculation via surveys. Um, and then you know, and we'll talk about a little bit how you can do this. And then an emissions factor um, is added to that. And, and those reductions are made hybrid. I, so um, category seven, very interesting. I didn't know there were categories to the scopes. Um, do those categories as they go up in number kind of get less and less important perhaps? Because, you know, this is the first time ever hearing employee commuting was part of scope three, but I don't deal with this stuff very often. So I might just be completely clueless, but it's interesting to me. So I'm just curious, seems seven seems kind of high. Maybe it's one of those things that just gets ignored a lot. Great question. Um, so I would say in terms of how you can think about the greenhouse gas protocol um, and how reporting is done. So scope one is your direct emissions um, from your company. Scope two is indirect. So things like purchased electricity and um, others. And then scope three is what they call down, they're sort of like a downstream and upstream, but a lot of that ends up being your supply chain and purchase goods and services, things that um, you are bringing into your business, um, but might not be directly owned and managed um, by you. So that's how you, how you can think of scope, this the scope one, two, and three. I would say a lot of companies, you know, start with scope one and figure out, you know, how they're going to, um, reduce the emissions in their owned buildings, how they're going to source renewable energy, things like that, and then kind of move into the other scopes. Um, but as, and you know, more and more um, regulatory requirements are coming around this kind of reporting, scope three is becoming increasingly important um, for companies to focus on so that a lot of, I'll give you technology companies, for example, have very small scope one and two emissions and the majority of their emissions are in scope three. So it is actually really, really important um, to factor in, in and it really depends on the type of company, um, how much of those emissions are in each category. So hopefully that helps answer. But if you have, you know, you have an onsite that lots and lots of your employees are commuting to and they're driving, 30 plus miles every day that can really add up into your, um, into your emissions. Um, so just, yeah, that's sort of a, a good overview. Happy to share more about that. Um, but it, it is something to really consider for companies. Um, and it's something that I want to say it's like easy to reduce, but there's a lot of things that companies can do to help reduce those emissions. Um, teleworking, as they call it, or we call work from home right now, is a portion of that scope um, three, category seven reporting as well. Um, and so, you know, as we know, since COVID, now about 30% of workers nationally are remaining remote. Um, and some companies are 100% remote now. So um, more and more of that telework um, is, uh, you know, is becoming a bigger part of companies' emissions as well, and part of that scope seven. Right now, the way that it's reported on, it's optional, um, and I'd say more and more companies are like leaning toward including it, especially because so many employees are working from home now. Um, but we're hoping that like with the guy, there's new guidance coming out in the next year or two, that will become something that's required. Um, and the other thing to just touch on quickly is business travel. Obviously, another huge piece that employees um, play into. 
And um, what I would really encourage people to think about with business travel is you can do a lot with corporate policies there around, you know, frequency of travel, what types of things you can, you know, travel for, how you're making decisions and companies like Concur or other platforms that you might use to, um, to what's the word I'm looking for, schedule your business travel, have a lot of information on emissions from flights or, you know, the best routes to take that are going to reduce your emissions. And so really um, utilizing those tools and setting policies around that um, can be important. Any more questions on the scopes? Well, maybe you're going to get into this, so let me know. But the question I would have on teleworking is, is there a unified way that people can, uh, and it's optional, it seems, but that companies can measure and report that that is concise and consistent. And if you're planning to talk about it, great. <laughs> but that's the big question on my mind. So, yep, we'll get it. We'll get into that in just right. a sec. Um, so the greenhouse gas protocol, if never, no one's had the pleasure of like digging into it, has incredibly detailed specifications and recommendations on how to both measure and report on all of these different scopes, and they're constantly getting refined and updated. Um, so there is a lot of information there. Um, but just to quickly dive into a couple examples of how companies do this now. So um, for Commute, for example, many companies do some sort of employee survey, usually annually, or they are you know, have a lot more detailed information on how they're tracking their employees. So they're tracking, you know, every shuttle, every bus and like, you know, get a lot more um, targeted information um, directly from employees. But I'd say the majority of companies are using some sort of survey like this to really understand um, employees, you know, will tell you how frequently are they, you know, commuting to work? What modes of transportation are they taking? And then from that, the company can calculate, apply an emissions factor to each mode of transportation and calculate then the overall emissions from employee commute. So that's an example of how, how you can calculate your commute emissions. And then from that number, then we'll, we'll start later in the presentation to start talking about how we can make reductions. Um, and then, so work from home, is a lot more complicated. Um, so this is you know, an example of how we've done this at Canopy. Um, but what we do is we have a, a short onboarding that asks information. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this with more of your, you know, how we do intakes around information around homes, but we ask information about you know, location, the size and age of your home, your appliances and your fuel sources and use that to calculate your overall home emissions. And happy to talk more about that. We're using the Rex data set and eGrid um, and then modeling out what those overall emissions look like. So that's an example of how a company can utilize a tool to collect that information from employees to get to a work from home emissions number. And from that, from that say like overall individual emissions, you would apply a percentage to that of you know, how much time are they spending at home? And then what's the size of the space that they're using for their work at home? Does that typically line up with the, um, when you do your taxes, I think it asks you that question, like what space are you Perfect. using? Is yeah. that, do those line up pretty much the same? Yep. So we, um, in the greenhouse gas protocol, they've got some like, uh, recommendations, but yeah, you'd basically say like, what's the size of your office space that you're utilizing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's hard because people work from everywhere, right? It's like, I spend time well, like yeah. in and <laughs> right. Like, Move your laptop office, around the house, like, well, what? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, you basically make an estimation of like, oh, I spend time in like a 12 by 12 space or 10 by 10 space. Um, and, and then apply that to, um, to the overall home emissions. Right. Trying to figure out, oh, 10% of my house is dedicated to work. Yep. 10% of my energy is responsible for that. Something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Now, when you're calculating emissions, my understanding is one of, um, in the past, we calculated electric emissions just based on a sort of standardized carbon based on kilowatt usage, right? Gas, we know if people are still using gas that's an easy one or propane. Do you, are these systems getting updated to really consider what actually happened on those local grids at the time? Um, 
you know what I'm saying? Like the makeup of the renewable power it might be very different in Washington versus here in Michigan, where we have currently lots of coal. Yeah, Vicki, do you wanna talk about it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a bunch of public data sets. Um, eGrid is the one that uh, Canopy uses that, uh, measures exactly that what is the makeup of kind of the the you know broader grid in the area um and you know as the grid is greening obviously you know we're keeping that updated and making sure that um we're keeping that kind of stuff in mind as well as uh any renewables that you know that particular employee might have like if they have rooftop solar that's um mm -hmm. taken into account because they're not necessarily pulling as much energy from the grid so yes mm -hmm. So it's fair to say if that employer has um, prominence in their local market and can advocate for more utilities to be added, they could also reduce their employees' emissions. It sounds like it's a very long process, but is that true? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Okay, well, thank you for entertaining that. So. Um, Okay, so now let's jump into the fun part, which is reductions. Now that you've done all the measuring, and I think you know what we try to really work on with companies is not you don't just want to measure things. Our whole goal is making reductions. Um, but now that you've got a baseline, how do we start to make reductions? Um, so this is some initial ideas to start to talk about and think about. But I'm sure um, it'd be really interesting after the present presentation to talk through other ideas that people in the audience might have. Um, for how to work with their employees. Um, so one is, you know, offer incentives to reduce fossil fuel usage, things like, you know, give employees $100 to switch to renewable energy, or, you know, here's $500 to put towards a heat pump water heater, things that are going to really um, decarbonize, help to decarbonize that home. Um, provide and reward other modes of alternative transportation. Um, so this is pretty common. I think a lot of people are aware, you know, you, Companies offer stipends for public transportation, um, shuttles to take to work, et cetera, but really making that easy for your employees to not drive their combustion engine vehicle, um, move to you know things like public transportation or biking or even electric vehicles um, as well. And then providing the, the charging infrastructure for that. Um, helping employees sign up for renewable energy. We talked about this, but um, whether that's community solar, um, signing up through their utility for a 100% renewable um, plan or installing solar at home and making that easy. There are companies that offer, you know, do a partnership with, with a local solar installer and then offer a, a discount to employees um, to be able to install solar and then do that as a bulk purchase together. Um, so again, trying to make it really easy um, to sign up for those programs or make those upgrades. Um, just providing the education and resources um, to help employees reduce their fossil fuel usage by things like learning about heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, induction stoves, um, and others, you know, sort of weatherization and efficiency items in the home that can really help reduce emissions. Um, so just making that really easy and available. Um, educating employees around about resilience. Um, so things like helping purchase renewable batteries, um, or sorry, purchase batteries, or, you know, thinking about um, other ways. Um, and we've got some of these other examples, but thinking about air filters, I live in Oregon, and we've been having horrible wildfire smoke right now. So things like, you know, if my company was providing me with options for air filters, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and, you know, similar things like, dealing with insurance around flooding or, you know, how you're going to have an evacuation plan if something happens, but really supporting employees around all of those things that are going to create additional stress in their lives if they're not able to deal with them at home. Um, and then the last thing I'm adding in here is just being able to track progress and cel celebrate um, your successes and providing case studies um, and success stories from employees We've done a lot of research around community-based social marketing and peer-to-peer -peer education around this is so impactful. And I'm sure you know this too, neighbor-to-neighbor, peer-to-peer, employee-to-employee. Employees have um, already built this bond and have a relationship with each other. So really being able to help share those stories and case studies is incredibly impactful um, to help someone make, um, make some sort of upgrade. Um 
I'm really glad you pointed out like the filtration and the health aspect. I'm curious to what extent um, these kinds of things are being discussed or leveraged as part of the employee's overall health benefits package. So for example, like you said, uh, you're living somewhere and there's wildfire smoke and your employee is getting polluted, right? Uh, is that being connected you know, beyond decarbonization, like, hey, if we help them electrify, there's a health aspect here. And can companies then leverage actual dollars from the healthcare markets to make these improvements? Have you seen anything like that? It's a great question. We really haven't. Um, we've been talking to companies about it. Hmm. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to do. Um, but, and sadly, I think with more and more of these things happening every year, heat waves, right? Like a lot of the country yeah. this year has been in heat waves. People need more air conditioning, but ideally heat pumps. Right. Um, and, you know, how do we, how do we help educate um, benefits teams and others around the value um, of doing this and like proving, proving the case that they should be supporting employees with these types of resilience upgrades, mm. um, I think is, um, is like a really important conversation that needs to be had more. What about, um, you know, em employers um, paying for the in-home energy audits and inspections? Have you seen that as a benefit being given out at all? Um, a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I think again, yeah, could be done a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, I think it's a lot of, a lot of what we've seen is it's like few and far between. It's definitely not something that's common or table stakes and, I think a goal of our all of ours is like, how do we make this something that becomes, you know, like maybe maybe it's not quite as common as health insurance, but you know, financial support or you know, family support or other types of um, other types of support that companies are giving to employees. One of the things I like to talk about is, you know, if you're getting a thousand dollars to the gym, you should be getting a thousand dollars for a heat pump. <laughs> um, Okay, so going to your point, Brett, on this, uh, on health and wellness. Um, so we, again, like really think this is an important topic that um, needs to be talked about more um, within companies, especially with, you know, benefits teams that are often the ones that are um, controlling, you know, how employees are getting access to these types of supports and services. Um, so on the health side, you know, helping employees remove household fuels from their homes, um, especially things like stoves, um, resilience. Again, we just talked about batteries um, with heat waves, like really talking about, yeah, don't just install another AC, like think about getting a heat pump, like why this is so valuable. Think about like efficiency and really help employees um, think about the right equipment that they need to get. And maybe that inc includes getting an audit um, along the way um, to help them, you know, uh, address things like heat in a um, safer, cheaper, and better way. Um, wildfires and smoke, we just talked about, but things like air purifiers, apps to monitor fires. And then there's lots of extreme weather and disasters happening, but thinking about how you can provide emergency kits, make plans, um, and really support employees as, um, as things happen. Um, so here, I just wanted to share a couple of recent headlines of companies that are starting to get um, into this idea of really supporting their employees around climate. So Walmart is um, doing work to um, help its workforce access bikes and scooters and carpools and, and reducing, um, reducing car usage. Amazon similarly offering a monthly benefit for commuters who bike to work. Um, thinking about EVs um, as a corporate benefit for employees. And then this is another one that's like, how do you protect your workforce from extreme heat? Um, so I won't wanna say a lot, but like there's more attention <laughs> on some of the, the things, uh, the work in this space. And um, and I think, you know, as, as there are greater impacts, it'll just be something that's talked about more frequently. Um, so now we're just gonna talk about some of the benefits from an employee engagement perspective um, on why it's valuable to engage your employees around sustainability and climate. Um, so the first is that, and this is a study from the National Environmental Education Foundation, 
found that nearly 90% of employees that were engaged in their company's sustainability work say it enhances their job satisfaction and feelings about the company. So it's really something that can help drive that um, employee satisfaction over time. Um, it can also help attract talent. Um, two and three workers give preference to jobs in environmentally responsible organizations. And you'll definitely see that with younger um, generations of employees, it's very important to them to align um, their values with um, who they're choosing to work for. Um, and it can also help you drive your business goals. So in the study by um, PwC, businesses with highly engaged employees saw higher customer satisfaction, lower turnover rates, um, and outperformed in terms of um, corporate responsibility impact and ROI. Um, and we're better, better positioned to adapt to um, anticipate and adapt to changing market conditions. So really, you know, driving that employee engagement can ultimately lead toward um, improved business goals. Um, and the other thing I just, I thought this was great that I also found in a study, the things that have the biggest impact on that employee engagement are whether the employee can incorporate sustainability into their job and their personal life. So I think an important note here is that um, actions at work are important, but also being able to tie those to um, your personal life really matters as well. Um, so last note, just on all of the benefits for companies and sort of if you're thinking about how you bring this to your company or address it, um, you know, you can talk to your team about all of the benefits for employees that, you know, if you're, if you're trying to bring this kind of benefit in. So it's, you know, pollution reduction, you're improving comfort, you're lowering bills, improving home value, improving health and safety, like we talked about, re reducing maintenance costs, providing energy resilience, and then ultimately performance. But there's, you know, addressing, you know, a whole lot of um, employee, employee benefits and, um, and improvements, you know, to to their well-being in their life with addressing decarbonization. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to note was there's a lot of really really good resources um, for um, you know starting to do this work. So I love to point to Drawdown. Um, Drawdown Lab specifically has done a whole series on climate solutions at work and how every job is a climate job. So as you think about um, incorporating climate and sustainability more throughout a company. Um, they've got really good guides for every single department. You know, if you're in finance or you're in human resources or marketing, how can you bring climate into your job? And what are the things that you're responsible for that are related to sustainability? So in this case, you know, someone that works in human resources might, you know, not think that climate has anything to do with their job, but there's actually a lot that they um, have purview over um, that, is really impactful to their employees. Like we just talked about a whole a whole lot about you know climate benefits, um, but also 401ks and how you know you can offer fossil free 401ks um, for employees, for example, that are then contributing to reducing the money that's going to fossil fuel companies, for example. Um, I linked Canopy here, and then Carbon Collective is is a great company that works on fossil free 401ks. So I wanted to mention that as well. Um, and I'm happy to share any of the other, um, the slides or any other resources we talked about. And that's it. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, thank you. And I, I guess um, we're wondering if those links can be shared as well um, while yes. we're talking briefly. <laughs> yes, that sounds great. Let me stop, share, and then we can, I'll pop them in the chat. Um, so uh, uh, th there was a question that came up and I want to kind of um, expand upon it a little bit here. Uh, it had to do with, you know, when there's a recognition that your maybe your employees are working in apartments, right? And they may be limited on the structural changes they could make, even if you wanted to help them make them. And so obviously, you know, we have all sorts of conversations and technical ideas that we've talked about here before and we'll talk about again for renters and need to do more there but what if companies you know we hear this term workforce housing what if they're just like okay you know 
the housing here is not great. We're just going to make our own housing. We'll make it net zero, healthy housing. How much are you seeing that, you know, just, all right, let's just make our own housing and then we don't have to worry about it. We'll drop our scope three emissions, chapter seven anyway, down to zero. <laughs> um, I, I would say not much. I think there are some companies that... Um, are you know have a huge presence in a local area and then might invest more so i can a little bit from personal experience i used to work at facebook and so they had you know purchased they as part of they had this huge piece of land and decided to turn it into um apartments and so for them like they were making that mm -hmm. development super like you know all um all net zero but i think for the majority of companies that's not how they operate um and and house employees so i think it's really if we're going to address you know the problem at the scale it needs to it's it's how do you help employees at home right yeah with the existing housing that they have um and i i i i saw the piece you know you mentioned the the solar sort of group buy um and i have heard in the past of um green bank buy downs have you seen anything like that where they basically uh, co companies come in and buy down the rate to let's say, get lent home improvement. Have you seen those kinds of things? Um, yes, but I'm trying to think if it's actually happened with employees. Um, Vicky, do you have a good example of that? I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, I think it's a great idea. And so the way, maybe we can just talk about how this could work, but a company would basically, instead of say offering direct funds to an employee, Mm -hmm. um, put money into a pool that's then buying down the interest rate on a loan. So they could say, Hey, employees, we're going to offer you a zero interest loan mm -hmm. to be able to buy your heat pump. And maybe that, the, you know, the loan comes directly off your paycheck. I think something like that would be awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah. I yeah. haven't seen anyone do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but me being able to like really easily, um, say like, Hey, we're super supportive of this. I know a lot of companies do help employees with mortgages, you know, sort of similarly. And so yeah. I think there's a really similar pattern there. It's like, Hey, in addition to providing mortgage support, we're going to provide home improvement and support with a zero interest or super low interest loan. Um, that, you know, then you, then you can pay them. Yeah. Well, that reminds me, I've seen some employers now, um, if people move into the facility they're giving, the vicinity they're giving, whatever, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 towards the cost of purchasing a home and working there, right? Yep. You know, it seems like they could just expand on that and say, and, you know, that money can go towards green upgrades or shit or whatever it might be, you know, so. Yep. Um, how, I mean, how often are employees truly broadcasting, um, you know, I know they're, they typically broadcast their emissions, but how often do they break these emissions down from scope one, two, and three, and then further break them down into chapter seven of three, and then further break it down into optional teleworking chapter, you know what I mean? Like, is that getting showing up in an ESG report somewhere? Like how often is yes. that stuff even being disclosed? <laughs> yes, a lot, a yeah. lot now. Um, and again, I'd say like sort of depends on the size of the company, but like, you know, most Fortune 1000, like 100% are doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and and then I'd say it's like more and more to mid midsize and smaller companies. And as companies like I'll list a couple of names, but like Watershed and Sinai and like Salesforce is now in this business and Microsoft. There's all of these measurement and reporting platforms that exist now um, for companies to do this measurement. So a lot more companies are doing it and reporting on it. And part of that reporting, it's been voluntary to date, but there's um, an SEC disclosure rule that is coming. Um, and it has been, the SEC took like a ton of comments in, but they are, it's like everyone's still waiting for the actual ruling to come out on what companies are going to be required to report on. Mm -hmm. But as soon as that's announced, then companies will be, public companies will be required to report on their scope one, two, and potentially three, um, like eventually three, I'll say, um, emissions as well. So that's why a lot of companies are like, okay, we've got to start doing this. We've got to get ready because this regulatory requirement is coming. Okay. So when um, employers decide to use, you know, whatever these various 
measurement programs and um, whatever that might be, uh, whatever entity they might be working with, do you know uh, if they come with uh, any kind of coaching aspect? And so you've got the sort of dashboard that you showed and, and you know, it sounds like it kind of lines up with scope three, seven, so people can report accurately, but is there any additional sort of support or coaching that comes around that? And like, here's how we can help you out. There's a ton of questions on here is how do I do this? And I think, you know, anyone who's following us keep attending, we're going to answer the question for always how you do this at home. But, <laughs> uh, you know, just again, if there's a resource out there, um, that sort of revolves around the, um, results of the, 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 the emissions tool. So. Yeah. Um, well, we, if it's okay, we can quickly show like how we do this with canopy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Please do. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to be <laughs> conscious not to be like, um, showing too much. Uh, where is my, I lost my toolbar. Hold on one second. Now quit. Okay, there we go. Hopefully that'll work. Get my toolbar back. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to quickly walk through this. This is um, how, like, we do this at Canopy. There's obviously lots of different ways that you can create programs and really help your employees with this. But um, what we've tried to do is make this really easy. Um, I'm just going to move this to my zip code versus Alabama. Um, so we, again, we talked about this onboarding, but this is how we kind of like collect the information to mm -hmm. then help you determine those um, emissions from the home, appliances and fuel sources. Um, do they purchase renewables or have solar or batteries? Um, what are their vehicles? How much do they drive them? Do they have an e-bike? Um, and then this is the commute questionnaire. So, you know, how often are you commuting? Um, via what types of transportation. And then this like opens up other windows if you're like, actually I do two days of this and three days of this and um, other things. Um, and then we ask people what they're interested in. So, you know, do you wanna learn about getting an energy audit or an induction stove um, or insulating your home better, but really help, um, we ask employees, you know, what do they, what do they wanna learn more about? Mm -hmm. um, and so from this, there's, yeah, this dashboard showing, you know, where your emissions are coming from across different categories. If you've made reductions, what those look like, if there are funds, so we make it easy for companies to, you know, we talked about how incentives can be really valuable in this space. So you can add incentives for your employees to then make those reductions. And the nice thing about this is like, it's, it has to go directly to some sort of decarbonization purchase. So again, it's like use it or lose it type of dollars here. Um, mm -hmm. So it's only going towards reductions. Mm -hmm. um, we then, you know, show you the incentives and rebates that you qualify for. This is just featuring the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, federal incentives and ta tax incentives here, but we'll be updating with, you know, rebates and, you know, include income qualification questions as necessary, and then are also localizing this. So down to state and local level, um, you can see a leaderboard of like how the team is doing and then go into each of these recommendations. So, you know, we talked about just getting a home energy audit. It's like, learn more about how to do this, right? You see mm -hmm. someone at my company <laughs> has already gotten an energy audit. Um, and then we talk to you about like what the economics would be if there are rebates and tax incentives around this that you can qualify for, how an audit works. So a lot of the work here is educating employees around this. And many of us are you know professionals in this field, but a lot of people just don't even know. And this is what we spend time working with people on. Mm -hmm. Don't have no idea how to get started. They don't know what's in their home. Um, and so, you know, how do you break this down as in an e really easy to digest mm -hmm. way so they can get started. Hmm. Um, and then you're like, great, I'm ready to go get an audit. Like, how do I find an energy auditor? Um, you know, we direct you to some different resources um, and, you know, have a whole contractor network built out to find um, people in your area, then, you know, complete this audit. Um, and I'll just, let's show one that's like a little bit more more in depth so you can see what this looks like. Um, but, you know, if you want to learn more about a heat pump, we talk about, you know, what the economics are and the lifetime potential costs. Again, those incentives and rebates, the values for you and benefits of perhaps installing something like a heat pump. And then, you know, 
have a guide again to make this much easier for your employees to get started. So like learn how to check the age of your HVAC system, um, figure out how you find your tax incentives and rebates. You can fill out a form, our team will help you do that. Um, figure out the right type of system. Again, like just a bunch of education around, um, you know, the different types of heat pumps, what you wanna consider, how to find a local installer, help with quote review, um, and then, you know, eventually install your heat pump. And then we handle reimbursements with companies that um, want to be able to offer that, that sort of discount. Um, so again, that's sort of our, our version of this, the kind of how to, and then along the way, say you want to do something like incorporate a promotion or a deal with a local and solar installer, we can just easily build that in and say like, hey, we're working with X solar installer and you can get a discount um, by working with them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thanks for, for, for uh, walking us through, you know, some of those details. Um, the, uh, hopefully that answers the, the question that came up about the coach. I mean, it seems like the coach is somewhat specific to the tool itself. Do you typically see that maybe a sustainability director of the company sort of gets assigned the knowledge of needing to know this and kind of guiding people through it? I mean, is that ultimately what ends up happening? Um, so sustainability leads definitely get these questions. And yeah. what we hear from some of the ones they talk about are like, oh, this would be so great because I get employees coming to me all the mm -hmm. time asking what they can also be doing at home. And I don't know what to tell them. Mm -hmm. um, or like they're giving a smattering of recommendations um, around different types of solutions. And I think what we're really trying to do is ground this in the data of what is most impactful for employees to do. Mm -hmm. um, as I think most of us on this call know, the majority of our individual emissions come from our ener energy use, right? Um, you know, in our homes and our transportation. And so for a sustainability lead to be like, oh, what you really need to do is just like be composting and eat less mm -hmm. meat. Like, yes, those things are impactful, but they're not addressing the biggest source of emissions for most individuals. So what like we really try to coach them on and like talk about is how you know, yes, all those things are important and it's important for employee groups to discuss them and, and make behavioral changes, but by far the most impactful thing that any individual can do is reduce their energy use. So right. like, let's make that easier. And it's also the hardest thing to do in many cases, but like, how do we make that easier for your employees so that you as a sustainability lead, that's also trying to do reporting and buy renewable energy and reduce, mm. you know, do all of these things isn't also mm. then trying to answer all these questions for your employees. Um, do you uh, see, have you or ever seen using um, the competitive approach? So for example, doing um, like a, you know, one time we did something with a city called a biggest loser challenge, right? I think that show kind of was been discredited in many ways, but that concept, <laughs> right? Like yep. trying to understand you know, your employees who are the biggest energy hogs and having them compete and using that as a fun. Have you seen or done anything like that? Um, we, we have that little leaderboard on there to really show like who's reducing the most. Um, oh yeah, true. Yeah. Which we, yeah, we haven't done the inverse yet, which is like, who's the biggest, the biggest right. emitter, um, which I'm sure would be powerful, but maybe yeah. not. Um, yeah, obviously uh, opt in, right? Like, do yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. Or you can win a prize. Right. Like, obviously, we don't want anyone to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be a great badge. Like you are you're yeah. a bad um, So that's the way that we've thought about it. But I think, again, I'm yeah. sure there are great ideas here. And I think this is really goes to like, what's the culture of your company? What are people interested in? Like, how can you get them to be excited um, about this type of program, you know, how can you create competition or, you know, do some, some fun webinars, games within, within the company mm -hmm. around it. And so I, I would really yeah. encourage people to think about like, yeah, what's your company culture and how can you, how can you make this fun? Yeah. And on a fun note, you know, what are some of the upgrades that you're seeing people are most excited about? And um, following up on that question is what's been surprising based on what you're seeing, if anything. Vicky, you want to talk to that? Yeah, sure. So um, 
EVs, solar, and induction stoves are kind of the things I think that most people know about or have heard mm -hmm. about. So people get excited about those. And one of the big um, jobs that we have is educating them about how their HVAC system mm -hmm. system is also like really exciting and how uh, you know it's something that they should get excited about because it has all these other benefits. Most homeowners um, really don't think about their HVAC or water heater unless something is wrong, and they're maybe not you know haven't right. consciously put together that they're like burning fossil fuels inside their homes and contributing to like that that's contributing to a big part of right. their their emissions um so i would say people come in excited about ev solar and induction and um, we get them excited about heat pumps and heat pump water heaters yeah um and was there anything like out of that that surprised you um or anything else that's come up i mean <laughs> I don't know that I have an anecdote off the top of my head of what surprised me. I think we've learned a lot about how to kind of talk about these things to homeowners that don't think about these systems um, and, mm -hmm. you know, what resonates. Um, obviously, unsurprisingly, like if people can save money on their energy bills, that's a huge hook. Um, I think if people understand the health benefits of, of this green technology, um, that definitely gets them interested. And I think for certain parts of the country um, where, you know, power outages or just resiliency um, is really important, that is definitely a hook as well. Yeah. Yeah, it would definitely seem that if, especially if you're relying on a work from home workforce and their power keeps going out, that, you know, batteries and solar would make sense, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, one question I have is obviously on, you know, scope three travel tracking, certainly unless somebody's using an electric car and plugging it in, that's easier to track. But trying to track your gas usage is just such a pain, which is another reason why going electric makes more sense. But um, so you're relying on these surveys, but for home energy use, do you have situations where you can just have the company set up an agreement with the utility to API that data and just get it? And then you don't have to bug people for it. I mean, are you are you using strategies like that? Go ahead. Yeah. You, I was gonna say we have we haven't to date, but um but I think there's potential. I think there's privacy concerns there that would need to be kind of just like thought about and and worked out to, to do something like that where you're then sharing your utility data with your company yeah well and obviously i'm sure there'd be a disclosure form and, and all those things and on that note a question that came up is just you know having um collaboration with utility outreach programs um are those things that you you've been doing if if they already have a program in place um, you, I, yeah, what we've talked to some utilities, I think there's like a lot more collaboration to be done. Um, one example, and this comes from our friends at Nest that they did, and I'm, I'm sort of curious why it hasn't been replicated more. And I think it's just bringing the, all the parties together, but I'm, I'm interested in this model. It, I think this was in North Carolina with Duke, but they, um, it was like Nest and Duke and a health insurance provider, like all came together so that when employees were enrolling in their health benefits, they were also offering them smart thermostats at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with all the, the utility discounts and other things. So, it, you know, sort of made it an easier sell within that flow of, mm -hmm. I'm already thinking about, you know, signing up for mm -hmm. something. Now I can get a free smart thermostat. Like, let's make this happen. So I think really thinking about again, like how you build this into existing workflows or ways that people are thinking about it is, could be really, really awesome. Um, so that's just like one example, but I think there's a lot more opportunities to, to think about how you bring some of these um, systems, I don't know, like workflows together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on, on sort of a, a, a last note here, um, are you looking for, um, you know, obviously, you might go into an area where you don't have many contacts or resources. Are you looking for local collaborators at all who might be able to provide some of the on-site educational or assessment services? Great question. Yeah. I mean, I think um, if there are um, companies, you know, it's like bring in a big company and then bring in like more mm -hmm. local education to that company related. I think that's amazing. <laughs> Um, would love, would love to talk more about it. Um, but I think 
we definitely see, I'll call it like one-on-one human in the loop type support really adds to the digital component of this, right? So, and mm-hmm. I think everyone knows this, right? Like getting getting someone to come to your home and actually look at things and tell you about it is incredible, like much more impactful than just reading mm-hmm. something. So I think it's mm-hmm. really trying to pair these things together where it's like, you know, start, get started, um, fill out an assessment, start to learn more about what you can do. But then, yeah, if someone can come talk to you about it more personally, I think it's incredibly impactful. Great. Um, well, um, I think we are at our time here and I don't really see any other questions, but before we wrap up real quick, as a reminder, this session is being recorded so you can rewatch it anytime on our YouTube channel. You can click subscribe and you'll get an instant update when it is available. For those of you watching this in the future, not right now, but on demand, take that 10, uh, or that quiz, whatever the quiz is with an 80% passing rate, you'll receive your certificate. For those of you watching this here today live, uh, check your spam at certs at gutenbergcerts.com. As long as you've been here for the full CU hour, you'll be approved. And again, before we wrap up, a huge thanks to our board of directors, all of our volunteers, our executive director, Jose Reyna, our nearly 300 members, and our top tier sponsors who are going to help you and your employees all decarbonize, including Mitsubishi for air source heat pump systems, electrification, Ream for air source, water heat pumps, and our other sponsors who help you make impacts. We we're appreciative of them. Um, so with that, uh, Lauren and Vicki, I really appreciate your time. I uh, appreciate having uh, Canopy come out. I hope everyone can go and check them out and learn more about what they do. And uh, take care, everyone, and have a great uh, rest of your week. Thank you. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.